thank you very much, as I said, for having me this evening. And I hope tonight is valuable. I have to say it was fantastic for me to put together the presentation for tonight because, um, you know, we live in our own bubbles and uh, I think that I know what's happening, you know, in the um, photography world, but it was fantastic for me to be challenged to think what could I present that was creative and exciting. So first cab off the rank, let me just see that I'm sharing my screen. First cab off the rank is this work. So what I'm going to do tonight is I think I've got about 30 images I want to share. Um, and of course, if you know me, there's a reason for them all. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, to share some ideas. And I hope my enthusiasm comes across as well. But I wanted to start with some crazy stuff. So this is um, from an artist, uh, Emmeline Zanelli. Uh, it's called A Futurist Hoon in Tight Spot. It was made this year. It's a vacuum sealed cuttlefish ink photo polymer print on egg pasta. <laughs> I kid you not. Um, and if we go to the next slide, you'll see there are the nanas uh, making the vacuum sealed cuttlefish ink photo polymer print on egg pasta. And I'm, I'm starting right up front with this one because it's the weirdest thing I'm going to show tonight. And it's actually, you know, a photo and it's creative. And I think it's really exciting. And what I wanted to share with you is the thought process behind this particular work. So I'm going to read from the artist statement that says, drawing connections between memory and the strange ways we stage and capture it. The narratives behind my work use images as mediators between characters, seeing people become materials, the photograph becomes an object and the object becomes a sitter. So this one is, um, it was called Futurist Hoon. And if you have any knowledge of um, different um, periods in art history, you might be aware of the Futurist period. Um, and uh, there is a painting um, called uh, Crash Factory um, by a, futur a Futurist painting of the time. And um, it's about the Futurist ideology. Um, and in this production of the artist, the photographer's work, it's the artist's grandmother Mia and her friends working together in a suburban dining room to create multiple copies of this key futurist image. Uh, um, da, 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 few, sorry, I've just lost my um, thought. Onto sheets of pasta using an etching press. By considering parallels between aesthetics of manufacturing and the mechanics of me memory and proposing family legacy as a form of collective repetitive production. Zanelli's work is distinctly misaligned with the violent prophecies of the futurists and serving to instead heighten the relationship between the domestic and the industrial. So I've gone, I, I, I'm a big believer in the pendulum effect. I've gone super out there tonight to start with showing the crazy and the wonderful and what I think is really exciting and very art. You know, all those words there are very much you know, academic art. And then really my message is to say that contemporary photography, contemporary art, let's be honest, I think anything goes. Now, if my volume and sound is okay, I'm more than happy if people do want to jump in or maybe just, Brian, if you popped in now or if someone maybe unmuted themselves and just let me know that I'm going okay for volume and um, I'm travelling okay. It's fine with me, Lisa. Okay, great, fantastic. Thanks, Brian. So in terms of um, where we're currently at, and I really probably want to say that that art that we've just seen, you know, which is the um, vacuum sealed cuttlefish ink photopolymer print on egg pasta, that artwork that we've seen just then, um, unless you have an understanding of art history, um, and you have an understanding of process and you're willing to read the artist statement, that would make no sense whatsoever. And so what I want to do tonight is, I suppose, try and 
shock you a little bit. And that's a, they, the futurists were very much about that. So I felt that it was kind of an appropriate way to start tonight. Shock, inspire, challenge, annoy, uh, any of those fantastic words to really just engage you. And I promise it will get better. And I promise I'll look at some more interesting and more accessible work. But I wanted to start with that because it does prompt us to think, what is the art period that we're in at the moment? So we've had modernism, which might take us up to maybe the 50s, where there was the overlap between modernism and postmodernism. Um, then we had postmodernism, which was a rejection of modernism. And now we're in post, well, I'm not sure where we are, but we can definitely say that we're post postmodern. But I'm wondering and assuming that post COVID, and I don't mean next year when we can travel, but once the world has absorbed what COVID has meant, I feel that there will be art that will come um, that will obviously be our next moment. I'm sure, I don't know how other people feel, but I'm pretty sure that this is one of those seminal moments in time that will be uh, a, a, an era, whatever it is, um, whatever they're going to call this period, it could be COVID, I'm not sure, but whatever it ends up being, when they name it and look back, I suspect we'll see the beginnings of art to change. Now, art doesn't change just because of one thing, of course, but I think we know that with COVID, the timing of it, you know, it's all about the rise of social media, the rise of the individual, um, the, the rise of uh, technology, um, the surveillance state, all of those sorts of things. Um, I think we're even talking about, from an art perspective, we are in a post-digital world. And so really from a photography perspective, we're in a post-digital photography world. And I'll talk more about that. And I've got an artist as an exemplar to show who's exploring that and defining that. Um, now, this isn't new. I think we've been seeing this come about maybe in the last 10 years. So anyway, I think it's very exciting to see what's coming. But right now, I don't know that we have a word, but we're definitely post postmodern, which means that we've basically Postmodernism was a rejection of modernism, and post postmodernism just means we're over it. Um, we're beyond the the rejection, and I think really the tone of today is anything goes. So let's look at some artists who are um, now. When I say anything goes, I do believe that this is the time or the period where it's art of the personal. Obviously, it gets translated to be universal, and that's when other people start to engage with your work and your work gets traction. But I really believe that when I say anything goes, I think that's another way of saying you can make pho photographs or art about anything that takes your fancy. Um, it will be authentic to you, and you can go ahead and whatever floats your boat uh, is, is, I think, where we're at, which is a very freeing time as well. It's a challenging time for um, uh, um, organisations, um, whether they be academic um, institutions, camera clubs, uh, the AIPP, which is the Australian Institute of Professional Photography. Um, it's, it's a very interesting time because when anything goes, it's difficult to know what's good photography or who should I look at for inspiration. So my goal for tonight is to give you a, a number of artists, uh, photographers, or those artists working in the medium, um, whose work you can go and look at for inspiration. So let's get started. And many of these artists are new-ish to me as well. I've really tried to push beyond what would be the typical photographers you might come across, um, uh, say, at university. I've really tried to push beyond that. So this is a work by Lauren Dunn. Now I'll definitely provide this to Brian to pass on to all members uh, in the contemporary group, um, uh, the PowerPoint, which has the images, of course, it has the artists. If we just have a look, you can see, um, I don't know if that will, you can see I've got the artist's name uh, at the bottom of all of the images plus some language um, uh, around or, and the source of the image plus some information um, uh, from the artist or about the work 
by way of explanation, hoping, of course, that um, if anyone wants to go and research further, I've been able to facilitate that for you. So um, Lauren Dunn explores work about, um, she's very interested in the photo itself and the language of um, photography around food and consumption, advertising and things like this. Um, this is a series called New Romanticism. And this image was made from a shutter stock image library search for luxury food items. We can see here olives and oysters came up in the search. The artist selected the images, printed them and used them to create sculptural forms in her lighting studio and then re-photographed them to create the final artwork. I'm sorry if that um, resolution there is a little bit blurry, uh, but certainly you can go and look for that yourself. So this is Lauren Dunn, Fertile Ground, uh, New Romanticism. And what she's done is shift the context and scale of the food items and further romanticize them. She's addressing food politics. So I know that this is a bit academic, but I have to say that along with anything goes and you can make work about whatever it is that you want to make work about, you do still need to be making work that has a pretty robust uh, concept. And I know a number of you um, are working your way through the conceptual portfolio and your honours in that area. And that is about having a concept um, and seeing that through in a body of work. So the artists this evening that I've um, focused on and, are sh and I'm sharing, are, I suppose at the end of the day, conceptual photographers and they have something to say with their photos. So yes, anything goes, whatever takes your fancy, but it's work to have something to say. And I think that's a real marker of contemporary photography. That said, and we won't get off on a tangent because trust me, we could. You think about though, the way that the vast majority of the world consumes photography, you know, um, TikTok, uh, Instagram, um, Facebook, you know, scroll, 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 scroll. Um, and a lot of that uh, photography that's being made is for entertainment. So that's, and there'll be a million photographers now out there and particularly in the art university world that are going to be exploring the politics of photography for consumption. So anyway, um, this is Lauren's work. And um, so this is actually not her. So the source images are shutter stock images. Lauren then takes those, prints them, re-photographs them, frames the work and presents it um, as a finished body of work. Now, uh, Modernism was all about the, um, uh, the master author or artist. Postmodernism was about the death of the author or the rejection of um, someone, you know, being a master artist or owner of work. And it was, and then the whole period of something called appropriation came about. And this is, I suppose, our contemporary take on appropriation. And if you are worried or thinking about copyright and things like that, I really encourage you to research the um, concept of appropriation um, and look into that because there's a very solid foundation for appropriation um, in art and it's quite legitimate. Uh, and it's not about, you know, stealing someone else's images. So I hope that everyone's still got an open mind after presenting this work. So I've gone from like really out there crazy stuff, you know, cuttlefish ink on pasta photos um, to uh, appropriation, which is pretty mainstream now. And, um, and, and I think what a lot of us are as photographers is we're really hung up in making our own photos. So for some of you listening, this work will not be appealing to you and, and it probably, you know, will annoy you. Um, but this is the photographer's work. They've re-photographed it. They've presented it in their own um, style. And all of the artists that I'm sharing tonight, I've tried to make sure that they've legitimised in some way. So whether they've been exhibited in a public gallery space or, you know, they've received grants from the Australia Council, you know, to explore their work. So I'm trying to give you a curated look into contemporary photography or contemporary photographic artists. So our next, sorry, I'm just having trouble with 
There we go. Our next one is a really simple one. And for anyone that came to the APS photo walk um, talk, I love this work. It's by Mike Gray. It won the Clip Landscape Award, which is an award out of the Perth Centre for Contemporary Photography that explores um, uh, contemporary approaches to landscape. And uh, basically, this is called uh, Backyard Study. And Mike writes, in between the camera and the backyard is a single element lens that projects the scene into a plastic bag that acts like the focusing screen of a large format camera. Essentially, the materials act as a model for the human eye with the retina replaced by a disposable consumer item, you know, i.e. the, well, what would have been in the old days, the woolly shopping bag. So I've I've included this just because I love it and I think it's creative and I think it's really exciting. Um, I'm always impressed with photographers that take, that apply um, technologies of the past and think about how they can work in a contemporary space and how, you know, how, what better way to talk about the environment than to photograph it through the lens of something that destroys the environment. So I, I found this, you know, personally very creative and very exciting. I won't linger on this because I'm sure a number of you did also listen to the APS photo walk talk. Now here we've got something that is, you know, it's, it's not my cup of tea, but that's okay. And as you can see, the artwork is here. It's displayed. This is the artwork. I'm trying to sort of take my mouse and I hope I'm showing that clearly. And this is an artist called Eliza Hutchison. And this is inside the Victorian Parliament. It's commissioned for the Victorian Parliament in September of this year. It's called Just Want To Let You Know. Just gonna read the artist statement here. Experimental yet photojournalistic in approach, Hutchison's work draws on broader personal and cultural narratives while exploring ideas of abstraction which is, you know, where we get blurring and, and um, zooming in onto to something that's just, uh, you know, that abstracts the whole image because we're only shown a small part of it. It um, uh, uh, sporadic, intuitive and dispersed. The work coalesces to form a photo poem examining our personal communications and their implicitly political content. The work is an exploration of how discourse and meaning so, you know, truth and, 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 and um, I suppose truth and conversation are manipulated and hybridized in the image saturated condi condition of our post internet age, which is another, it's a term used side by side with post digital. So we're even in the post internet age. And as I think I might've said, the word post tends to mean, um, not only can it mean a rejection, but can also mean an interrogation. And what it means is that if, if you're post digital, if you're post internet, you're no longer just accepting the fact we have the internet, you're interrogating the structures that sit around the internet. And as we've all seen out of the last uh, American elections in particular, the power of the internet and who owns the internet, um, to influence politics. So uh, this, this is very much contemporary art. It could be very dry and it could be leaving you sort of going, oh, right, fine. Um, that's okay, I, I, bear with me. I think we'll pick up some momentum and we'll start to get into some, some more um, work that is perhaps relatable. But, you know, this is, my challenge tonight was, you know, creative and exciting. Um, and this is where contemporary photography is being commissioned or imagery is being commissioned um, in our public spaces. So it's about having these kinds of conversations. So that's Eliza Hutchinson, Hutchison. Um, look, this was a, a, an emerging artist called Kia Pullins. Um, I think Kia hasn't really, I think recently graduated from university, but I wanted to share this work. I just love the scale of the prints. And, um, you know, I love the presentation of them. Um, and don't forget that, um, you know, the works that I'm showing tonight, um, some of them are going to be the, um, uh, the uh, install view. So how they were presented in the exhibition. And I know for a lot of members of the contemporary group, you're, you are about having exhibitions and about getting your work out there. So I wanted to also share some contemporary approaches to the presentation of photographs. 
So Kia Pullins. Pullins artistic practice uses image archives. So again, I want to talk about the fact that this is appropriated imagery. I'm not sure about this specific work, um, but the sources for those archive images uh, could be dated Australiana and artistic imagery um, from um, community-based institution photographic archives. The sourced images are re-photographed and reprinted as large-scale analog prints, moving seamlessly between digital and analog processes to question what we're seeing and how images are made to seduce us. So, and it goes on, you know, there's lots of um, art, artist statement, you know, art exhibition, academic language, but it talks about, um, you know, embodied uh, printing techniques, fluid movements, uh, pushing the boundaries of the photographic medium where elusive qualities are formed through the layering of historical and cultural imagery. So I've included this, it's a little bit similar um, to the previous image by Eliza Hutchison in that, um, and also that um, uh, this image here that we saw um, uh, by um, uh, Lauren, Lauren Dunn, where these artists, sorry, Mike was the anomaly, wasn't he? It must have gone out of order with my slides. These artists are using appropriated imagery um, or images from uh, archives. So while maybe 20 years ago, people were mining the archive. So if you're interested in, again, finding out about copyright, appropriation, etc., there was an art, I suppose, a, a, a genre, I'm not even sure we'd call it that, called mining the archive, where people went back to um, imagery of the past and reinterpreted and, and used it to make new work. And so that continues to go. Um, to happen, but it's now within the context of the digital world. Um, Leah King-Smith mined the archives. Um, uh, um, if uh, archives are quite political and, for example, if we think about the archive in Australia, a lot of our um, old imagery that dates back to our um, um, uh, early uh, days of colonisation of the colony, um, were Im images of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders uh, taken for scientific purposes. Um, and so, uh, and this happened all across the world um, where First Nations um, uh, communities were photographed um, and archived because, you know, it was like a sign for, for science. And then now um, those artists are mining that archive and reinterpreting it. So the archive continues to exist. And can you imagine what the archive is now? You know, the billions of photos that are being made, you know, every year. Um, what is the archive going to look like in the future, in, in the next uh, iteration of mining the archive? So if you're interested in photography and history of photography, start looking at mining the archive you can search that term. This is a really simple photo. And I wanted to throw in, you know, something that's pretty straightforward. Uh, this is Abigail Varney. Again, I showed it in the APS Environmental Impact talk, but I just really liked it because um, I'm interested in the climate. Uh, it talks about, um, this is the buildup in those tropical environments, um, uh, Darwin in this instance where there's the murkiness that permeates everything during the build-up um, before, you know, the, the rain comes, you know, dark clouds block out the sun, brooding ambiance sweeps across the city, uh, strong winds, etc. cetera. Um, so I've included this because I know that it looks really banal and it probably looks like a nothing image, um, but I want to encourage you to, I suppose, pursue Again, whatever takes your fancy. Um, and obviously this is one of the body of, you know, a series of images that was made um, uh, as a body of work. And there are, uh, you know, a, 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 a range of images um, that are similar, but also um, are still cohesive, but also quite different. So um, it's a little bit like the Moran Contemporary Prize where they're, they're seemingly banal images, but they really do speak of contemporary life. And as a contemporary photographer or a, um, the contemporary photo group, um, I think it's quite a valid pursuit to um, explore 
uh, contemporary life and contemporary issues as well. And um, Abigail's work, it's really enjoyable and uh, it's a pretty straight approach as well. So I've included that tonight um, uh, um, for, um, you know, just a little bit of a, a line in the sand where we can say, you know, this stuff is still good, um, even though it looks very much like that snapshot genre, uh, snapshot aesthetic, I should say. Now, the next artist is also exploring um, the climate. And we quickly looked at uh, Clinton's work during the APS photo walk, but I wanted to share it again because it's a broader message that I want to share, is that um, very much now uh, there, are, there are stories that can only be told by the people whose stories they are. And um, so, for example, this is Clinton Niner. This work is called Stolen Climate. It's made from cotton and bleach, um, representing the capitalist industry of cotton that was born from slavery and theft, which helped create the foundation of what is known today as climate change. White King bleach is used in this work as a metaphor of Western imperialism and colonization. That's also played a major role in the creation of the circumstances we face together globally as people. So irrespective of your beliefs on climate change or colonization, I'm sharing this work because this is the kind of work that only someone who's, who can speak with authority through lived experience can make work like this. And it's just reinforcing that everyone today can make a valid body of work. Every voice is valid as long as it's authentic and it's about what is important to you. So I can't really go and make a work about a you know, stolen climate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, peoples in Australia because I haven't lived that experience. So contemporary photography is not about, um, I suppose, it's giving agency back or giving agency to those people who, who need to tell their own stories. You know, if we want to tell stories um, now in uh, this period, they need to be our own stories. So you may have an interest in climate change and the impact that it has on Aboriginal communities, and you need to find a way to tell that story that isn't trying to tell it on behalf of someone else. I love this work. I see it as very photographic, even though they're made on cotton and bleach. And I love that idea you know, that they're made from White King bleach and how the artist has linked that through to, you know, um, the effect of, of colonisation on climate change. Um, yeah, look, it's just fantastic. It's just so interesting and inspiring. And I hope that um, you're taking away from this, not the political beliefs that sit behind that work, although that was the intent of the particular artist, but I want you to be inspired to know that whatever your stories are, you can share them. But how awesome is that to share it with bleach, the actual, you know, a product that is a metaphor or a representation of the issue that you're exploring. Just find this an absolutely beautiful work. I think it was acquired by the National Gallery of Victoria. Uh, so again, I'm trying to share work that's sort of, um, uh, uh, what's the word, very legitimate and very validated as being contemporary and worthy of our attention. No matter whether we agree or not, we can't ignore the sorts of work that is being made around us. Uh, I might just get you to send a few comments through to Brian about whether the pace is okay, um, whether you want me to pick it up, whether I'm off track, whether people are yawning. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna keep going on uh, until you sort of tell me otherwise. But I, again, I hope I'm just, you know, challenging you and keeping you engaged with what's coming up on the screen. Now, this is a really interesting artist, uh, Sophie Gabrielle. Um, and um, uh, Sophie has an interest in psychology, science and perception. And it's a, I've chosen the bizarre images again, just to sort of put things out there. And again, this is about archival imagery from brain scans, um, science experiments, um, and uh, this particular body of work uh, has been 
um, described as a dreamy and deeply personal exploration of the artist's experience with cancer, presenting medicinal botanicals, photographic portraits alongside archival images from obscure medical research catalogues. So when you actually look at this entire body of work, yes, there are some of these images which we can see look like archival images from science experiments, but interspersed with that is work that the artist has made themselves. As we said, they're portraits, um, uh, um, images, some botanical images, um, and they're photographed through plates of glass to catch minute particles of the photographer's skin. So therefore images are overlaid with the artist's own DNA, creating these interwoven abstract self-portraits. I just find it absolutely fascinating where people go with their photography. Um, and, you know, I don't particularly like the, the work, I don't look at that and think, oh, I really want to see more of that, but I'm fascinated by it. So yes, I really want to see more of that. Oh my goodness. Um, and if you go and look at this artist's work, Sophie Gabrielle, um, fantastic. Really, again, won't be to everyone's cup of tea, but how different artists use the archive, but then bring in their own work in response to that. Um, so in the image we saw of the, you know, the Shutterstock images of the food, the artists made it their own because they, you know, printed them, cut them out, rephotographed them, framed them, etc. Um, this artist is making these archival images part of their own by making them part of a body of work. Um, uh, so, um, and, and a very personal body of work too. So remember when I said anything goes, this is this particular artist's personal story of cancer. We look back at Clinton Nain's work. This is Clinton's story, very personal story about his response to climate change and the bushfires. Um, can you see there's this theme that everything is very personal and the successful personal images are the ones that catch people for whatever reason. And I think that um, if we analyse these, I think we'd sort of say that some of them are, they catch you because of the presentation or the scale um, the perhaps the materiality of it. Others catch your eye because they're grotesque um, and they really get your attention. Um, but somewhere along the line, these successful bodies of work engage people. So depending on what your goals are with your photography, um, the, the, the challenge is, I suppose, is how to get your personal work and your, the, your personal messages um, to resonate with, with others. Um, uh, who, whoever it is that you're, you're wanting to, to ex, uh, engage with your work. So moving on, this is a new artist whose um, work I wasn't familiar with. Um, and this is Olga Bennett. Um, this work was exhibited at the Centre for Contemporary Photography in Melbourne um, back in 2018. And again, look, it's very much about um, uh, an looking at the archive and um, look, I, I have to, uh, you know, acknowledge uh, and a bit of a disclaimer. I'm, I'm obsessed with archives. I'm obsessed with my own family archive of, you know, of slides back from my childhood, my grandparents' slides when they went on their big European trip, you know, back in the seventies. The archive is something I find absolutely fascinating because when we look back to images from the past, we're looking for something about an understanding of our, of our identity today. Um, whether that's personal identity or the world. So um, uh, Olga, Olga Bennett, exploring the archive, but um, basically um, uh, gone through an archive library, re-exposed photographs with different images, cut them up, re-collaged, then um, someone touched them, then that got scanned and repeated and reproduced. So um, interesting body of work that um, not, you know, I'm not really, I'm not loving it, um, but you can see this is an installation view and you can imagine, you know, the, an entire gallery full of images like this. So they're abstracted, they're random, but they're really, they are photographs. They couldn't be more photographic, you know, than, than really what they are. We've got another artist here, Emma Hamilton, something very similar. And this was uh, taken during a residency in Paris where the photographer re-photographed photographs by the sculpture Brancusi from the Pompidou Centre archives, as well as Brancusi's studio, which are preserved behind glass. 
Um, then the photographer, Emma Hamilton, later photocopied them, holding them in her hands, and the photocopier took the images. Um, anyway, this is a Melbourne photographer, Melbourne-based photographer, and um, this was, as I said, created during an Australia Council Paris residency uh, back in uh, 2014. So I want you to know that, um, sorry, I should hide these. I want you to, oops, I want you to know that um, photographs, uh, we should challenge our definition of what is a good photograph as well. Now, this is one that I'm finding very interesting. Let me see if I can, here we go. Um, also by Emma Hamilton. So the previous artist that we saw, that was 2014. This is a new body of work. And this is um, about, this is called photographic tunneling. And I'm presenting this because I know, again, um, those members who are interested in looking at the contemporary um, portfolio and honours, uh, you do have to have an exhibition or, or a body of work that could be exhibited. And isn't this just fantastic? This is um, photographic tunneling seeks to use ice core, ice, I-C-E, core, C-O-R-E, sampling in Antarctica as a framework to observe the historical layering of our connection to landscape and how it's been shaped through the lens of photography. Um, using the premise of map tunneling and the process of ice coring, this project seeks to photographically tunnel through layers of landscape and to take us on a journey down into the earth through an installation of photographic ice cores and tunnels through rock, sediment, salt crystals and ice. Like photography, Ice cores present us with frozen snapshots of time, a series of preserved moments. And the photographs that form the basis of the exhibition were taken on residencies in Iceland and Victoria. And layers of temporal sediments allow us to move between two landscapes. And what I really love about this, and another reason I'm sharing this image, is the intersections of photography and sculpture. Um, and I have to say that uh, I know that for a lot of photographers, we ultimately end up exploring either installation work, possibly sculpture, because there's a point where the two-dimensional, we, we want to do more and we want to move into the three-dimensional. And um, it's very common for photographers to become interested in sculpture. And typically the way we do that is through photographic installations. And uh, I know I personally absolutely love um, installations and I love making work that's for a site specific installation, which is where you know where your work is going to be presented. And therefore you go and make the work to fit that space. So site specific um, work, it's, I find that absolutely um, really, really exciting. And like I said, there's something about leaving the two dimensional behind and getting it into a space. So this, that, that's Emma Hamilton. So we've got Emma Hamilton looking at the photo as object, you know, a photo of a photo of a photo kind of thing. And then we've got, you know, using photography uh, to talk about, you know, um, layers of landscape and to represent that um, uh, uh, physically as well. So I'm thinking that ticks the box creative and exciting. Oh, look, this is a favorite um, contemporary photographer of mine, Katrin Koning. And this is uh, from a body of work called Successions, which very much focuses on the vernacular, things in my proximity, she writes. The work is without agenda. It's a play with light, impermanence and faculties of seeing. I just love that. You know, it's simple. It's, uh, it's something we would, would steer clear of because obviously it's technically incorrect because it's completely overexposed um, but it's just fantastic and I share it as well because you know we can be making images literally you know in our backyard um, and we can make a body of work around us wherever wherever our world is um, and I know that through lockdowns uh, in the last last year and this year, 
uh, it's, you know, it's all very good, very, very well and good to say, oh, yes, you know, you can make work in your own home. Um, I'm not suggesting um, that, um, uh, that, you know, that that's possible because that's, that's quite a flippant uh, comment. This was more to suggest that um, at any point in time, um, we can still make beautiful images um, of ourselves, you know, um, in our own uh, environments or places that we're comfortable with. Uh, and we don't have to always make work that's big and on display um, and, you know, has to, uh, I suppose, you know, tick an awful lot of boxes. There's some simple work that we can make that I think is still very, very enjoyable. My next photographer I want to share is uh, Trent Park. And I'm absolutely, now I'm just looking at the time. Um, we've been going for maybe about 40 minutes. Um, does anyone want to, before I move on actually, um, because we're probably about halfway through, would, I might actually get uh, Brian to, I might stop and just see what the questions are, Brian, and, um, and what we might, um, yeah. If anyone's got that. There, um, there haven't been any real questions other than people checking up on the surnames of some of the um, oh, yes. people you were talking about, um, which mostly other people have been able to answer anyway. Okay, um, excellent. There was some feedback that um, the pace was spot on. Okay, um, great. And the other thing I might mention is that we, we lost Roger because of a lightning strike near him, oh. um, <laughs> sadly. Oh dear. And uh, I did, I sent a message to everybody who'd registered who hadn't turned up and uh, I've had a couple of excuses and one person has joined us as a result. But oh, fantastic. If, uh, just a new message just coming in now. Who was the name of the female who did the portrait just now? Oh, thanks for checking. So that photographer is Katrin, K-A-T-R-I-N, Katrin Pony, K-O-E-N-N-I-N-G. And what's interesting about this word is if I'm remembering it correctly, it was actually a sort of a, oh, what's that French word, tete a tete or something, the, the thing where people, you know, respond to each other, um, Saka Protic. Um, uh, is a photographer that um, came to notice with his work in the World Press Photo a few years ago that was quite controversial at its time. But um, Saka Protik and Katrin Koning made a body of work across the oceans. Um, uh, and I'm quite sure that this may have been part of that. And I think they ended up making a photo book together. Uh, Katrin, from memory, is a Melbourne-based photographer and, and just has done some very interesting work. So, um, all right, well, look, I'm going to keep going because Brian didn't indicate uh, anything otherwise. Um, and what I'll do though, is I'll try and repeat the photographer's name before I move on to the next photographer. Um, so Katrin Koning, and now moving to Trent Park. I just love this photographer's work. I'm showing now Trent Park, I first came across his work when we, you know, I was obsessed with street photography and I said, look, I still am, um, but I was really obsessed with it a few years ago. And um, uh, he was one of my favorite photographers. Um, he was originally a news photographer with the Sydney Morning Herald and, um, uh, you know, has gone on over the years to do street photography, very you know, mid minutes to midnight. So he does a lot of documentary work, but it's also quite conceptual and it's very, very unusual, but beautiful work. Um, and I, I normally show his work, you know, either through street photography or through portraiture, but I'm sharing this and I shared this a few weeks ago. I had a, an, an opportunity to present to a club, um, um, uh, the Kabulcha Club, and I shared his work because we were looking at, um, you know, this was actually, this is about cricket and I haven't, my son loves cricket. I happen to quite like cricket, but who would think that there could actually be a body of, you know, conceptual work around cricket? Well, if there's going to be one photographer, I think 
uh, that's going to do that, it would be Trent Park. Now, Trent Park is the only Australian member of Magnum Photo Agency. So he's, um, again, you know, I'm trying to share with you people that are really legitimate artists. And his, look, if you can get to any of his exhibitions or see any of his work, I really recommend it. Now, he's moving into the video space um, as well. And that's the other thing I will say, and myself included, is a lot of photographers are... Um, uh, exploring in parallel, not moving to because you're moving away from your stills, but looking at moving imagery as well, looking at video. Uh, so that's something that a contemporary photographer, for many photographers, they're quite fluid between the two. And sometimes the discovery you make in videos uh, can really assist your work in your stills photography. So try to be a bit open-minded about using your video, even if it's making videos on your phone, because any kind of visual work you make will influence um, uh, your other work. So I, um, and it just keeps you loose and it keeps your hand in, you know, uh, staying on top of, um, of making. So isn't this just wonderful? I'm just loving this, loving this work. That there's sort of an art, a body of work that's quite artistic. Now there's, a, I think this is, I don't know if it's a, I don't know how long the movie is, but if you look up Trent Park, uh, there's an E on the end of Park, um, and you will find this somewhere, Trent Park Cricket, and you'll find this body of work. Um, it's called The Summation of Force. In fact, you can find it at Magnum Photos. So magnumphotos.com. And I just, ah, oh, look, you know, it just, every time I think that Trent Park has done something new, he then does something even more interesting. So that's a photographer. I'm, I'm just inspired by his own journey as well. So um, uh, my son, as I said, loves cricket. I think that whatever Trent Park does is pretty awesome. So I'm pretty sure this is what my son's going to be doing these summer holidays. I'll be strapping some lights onto him and getting him to, um, to uh, be playing cricket. So uh, anyway, um, now it may not appeal to you, but um, you know, here we are, we've got one of you know, Australia's most renowned photographers making work and it's about cricket and it's art. So um, I hope that you're enjoying um, the quirkiness of that. Again, see how personal that is? That is completely, you know, only Trent Park could make that work because his sons like cricket. Apparently there was a point in time where he was a very good cricket player and could have gone on to choose cricket or photography. Uh, so remember what I was saying right up front, right now, anything goes, but typically this, the work that people make that res resonates with others is that really personal work because it's authentic. And therefore, anything that makes sense to you, you tend to do a really good job, you know, at exploring it. And the trick is to find the thing that engages your viewer. And, you know, for me, this is very visually stimulating. You know, I find, you know, the silhouette form, that's very reminiscent, isn't it, of the Mybridge um, uh, photo of the horse um, and tracking when, when the, the horse's hooves, you know, all lifted up off the ground at the same time. So, you know, even that sort of resonates back to, you know, the, the actual history of the medium. And, you know, we all love a good silhouette, but how interesting that the entire construct is shown, you know what I mean? So we can see this, the lighting, the backdrops and that sort of thing. Now that was very much what came about in postmodernism. So I think what we're doing now in this post digital world is what, what Trent Park is doing is not just leaving the remnants, you know, of the actual fact that this is a photo. Let's not pretend this is anything other than a photo. This is a photo. Um, but not only is it a photo, but we're making it because we're eventually going to create something digital about it because those, you know, dots are the things that allow um, people to, you know, do their movement tracking and things like that. So anyway, um, that's where um, I think that's the distinction between postmodernism and post postmodernism or post digital or post internet, wherever we may be at the minute. Okay, this is um, a body of work that I referenced quite briefly um, when we spoke um, for the environmental impact talk. This is Shimpai Takeda, and this is from the. Um, uh, Fukuyama, Fukushi oh, I've forgotten, Fukuyama nuclear reactor disaster from the um, tsunami. 
And basically, this is called uh, Trace Number 16, Lake Hayama at Mano Dam. It's exposures of contaminated soil to create abstract images that evoke the cosmos. Look, I just found that a very interesting photo, visually arresting. It certainly looks like an image of the cosmos um, and just fascinating to read about, you know, the, the, um, the actual work um, and the concept behind it. And I know in a normal camera club environment, you know, you would be saying, oh, well, no judge is going to understand that, you know, because there's no artist statement. But I know in the contemporary group, it's, it's a different tone. You know, you guys are making work to present, to exhibit with intent. It's conceptual. Um, and so, you know, exploring things and, and, and being aware of the artist's intent and the artist's statement, I know is, is important to you and very valid. So um, I'm sharing work that I wouldn't normally probably delve into too much um, in uh, a, a normal camera club environment, but I, I know that this will, well, I'm hoping this will resonate with you. So that was Shimpei Takeda, T-A-K-E-D-A. And there's a whole range of artists, obviously, that have made work in response to that disaster, I think in 2012. Um, so if you're interested in that, and again, there'll be a whole, like we saw with Clinton Nana's work made around the fires and the stolen climate. Um, artists make work in response to the disasters that they live through. And, um, and again, we're, we're obviously going to see all of this unfold um, post COVID because for many of us, we're still living in a version of it. And we're definitely not post COVID from an arts perspective because all of us now have to process what COVID meant and our responses to that. So be prepared. I think the first bodies of work that came out of COVID were all about isolation and not being able to touch people and see people. The next batch of images that come out around COVID will be way, not inter more, more interesting, they'll be very different because they will be that artists have processed everything that came and now need to process it back out. So what, what's coming next? I can't wait. I think in the next couple of years, it'll be, there'll be an absolute explosion of art and, um, whew, it, it'll be fascinating to see. This is a work, um, an artist, Anna Carey, an Australian artist. I think she's based in LA now. Um, and her work overlaps photography, model making, film and drawing. Through memory and imagination, cre she creates fictitious architectural spaces based on familiar iconic architecture that she photographs. The camera lens magnifies the model with all its imperfections and reminds the viewer that the photograph has been constructed with a miniature materialized object. This aims to reawaken imaginations for the viewer by creating a space of stillness and reflection for one to drift between reality and daydreams for rediscovering the universe that is inside ourselves. I had to read all of that out. I just find that such a poetic um, interpretation of the work, but it's actually completely spot on and factual as well. So um, a lot of Anna's work, um, her early series that were about miniatures and models and photographs and prints and things like that were based from hotels on the Gold Coast, which is I believe where she grew up. Um, can you see these are very personal stories as well? Um, but then, um, you know, really interesting and really engaging. So this is one of the latest bodies of work she's made called Palazzo Place 2020. And you can see that obviously, even though she's been making this work for a long time, that it's really quite interesting now because you think about this idea that it's photographs of familiar places, you know, relying on memory. It's been a long time since anyone in Australia has been to an Italian palazzo um, because of COVID. So Anna's work is taking on a new meaning now and how we interpret it and the longing and our response to that meaning. So I think that's probably the other side of that COVID coin as well. Not only will the work that we make be absolutely, who knows, wild and crazy and emotional, be just wonderful to, to experience and to be a part of, but we'll be reinterpreting work with a new universal lived experience. And it is quite unusual, isn't it, that the entire world has a shared uh, lived experience. <clears throat> I know it will be, it's tempered, you know, a Queensland COVID lived experience is nothing compared to a Melbourne 
which is nothing again, I'm sure, compared to perhaps some South Africa, um, Brazil, etc. But in essence, the entire world lived through something. Um, so it's the equivalent, I suppose, of, of an upheaval like a world war. Um, and everything gets reinterpreted differently when we look back. Just absolutely fantastic. So this artist is Anna Carey. I think you'd like her work. I, th I, I recommend having a look. And, you know, you can do this at home. And I'm not saying that to be flippant or facetious about COVID. It's more that, you know, we sometimes think that we need to go and be out taking photos, but we can do some things at home. And for some of us, that might suit us, depending on what it is that... Um, that um, floats our boat because remember anything goes okay this is one of my favorite artists and um, someone I love dearly Marion Drew now you would remember Marion's work from the um, her series I think oh maybe back in the early 2000s was um, Roadkill uh, does everyone remember actually let me see whoops let me see if I can oh sorry let me see if I can find this work. Okay, uh, just to refresh your memory, Marion Drew, um, still life. Let's just have a look at that. I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. So this is, you, I'm sure people would remember Marion's work. So it really was roadkill that was um, treated with dignity and beauty. Um, light painting, um, landscape backdrops were added, um, and, you know, it was a reinterpretation of the still life. In fact, my son, who does art in uh, high school, grade senior art in grades 11 and 12, studies Marion's work. You know, it's on the national curriculum. Anyway, so that's, the, I think that's the early 2000s. But if we now look at Marion's work, Marion is reinterpreting her own work so what she's done is she's still playing with the concept of still life. And now I'm hoping that my screen is still, did my screen share where I saw Marion's old work? Yes, it did. I, okay, great. So everyone could see the, the, the work where the, um, there was the dead lorikeet, I think, and the, um, the possum. So what Marion's doing is still using that same language, but she's actually cutting out old prints. And um, I think that's a print on fabric that she's made. And some of her other work is actually prints, literally print, print that she's cut out and she's reimagining her work. So representational strategies carry embedded, um, embedded notions of how we think about and conceive the world around us. The long history of the still life in painting and photography has portrayed shifts in philosophical scientific conceptions of the world. Tearing photographs and reconstituting them in new compositions, I intend to reference photography's shared history with painting and collage, shifted notions of space-time, as, well as well as the cut and paste of contemporary photographic processes. So isn't this wonderful that, you know, this is Marion's thing. She loves still life and here she is reinventing and reinterpreting for the, you know, for the contemporary photographic processes, um, something that she is completely engaged in and completely, you know, it's, it's, it's really, uh, I suppose, authentic to her. So I've shared that. I think is true inspiration because, you know, Marion's really been working in this space for a long time and manages to keep reinventing. So if you had like a favourite body of work that you've done from a, a period from a little while ago or, or just some favourite images, use those to launch into something new and think to yourself, what can I do? So Marion's, you know, tearing things up, repositioning them, re-photographing. Um, but yeah, think about what you can do with perhaps an existing body of work or a body of work from the past and how can you make it uh, into something um, and, and, and um, uh, conceptual or, or just revisit it in some way. Um, but don't throw away your past bodies of work. I'm moving on now to uh, Abelardo Morel. Um, I just, 
I'll continue to speak, but I can't quite see that my screen is still sharing, but I'm going to assume that it's sharing and that you can see the still life and, I'll, and there's no need to tell me otherwise, um, only if you can't see it. So the image I've got on screen is um, a still life filled with white vessels. So this photographer is Abelardo Morel, very well known for um, uh, his camera obscura work a number of years ago where he might be in a hotel room in Venice or in New York and turns the hotel room into a camera obscura and brings the outside in and in beautiful locations, obviously both in and out. So they were absolutely exquisite camera obscura images. So um, Abelardo Morel is now, or oh, this is some new work from 2020. It's a series called, series called Vessels. And I've included this because it's really technically, you know, it's a composite image. And I think that there's a lot of members probably in the contemporary group that really like to play in the digital space. So Morel shoots multiple exposures of arrangements of cubes, spheres and cylinders or glassware or porcelain crockery. Um, solids turn ghostly and imprecise, tones overlap. Everything seems to jiggle and be on the verge of mutating except the tabletop the arrangements rest on. I really just like this work. Um, and I encourage you to look at his, his, his bodies of work from the past. Um, Abelardo Morel, M-O-R-E-L-L. -L. Um, just really interesting. And I find these really quite beautiful. Um, and um, yeah, I, I don't do a lot of composite work. Um, but I, I, I know that um, a number of the members of the contemporary group do and you explore that. And um, uh, I did a talk on still life for um, a club and I included this because it's just wonderful, isn't it? And I also included it because sometimes for still life, we get so hung up on the fact that it really should be actual. Do you know what I mean? The actual objects when really we can make our still lives and I think sometimes we get stuck in our own rut so if you're a photographer that always um, you know is just uh, shoots straight so therefore if you were to do this still life you'd need the 50 white vessels on the on the table um, we tend to just get so caught up in that so we look around the house and we think oh I've got I've only got three white vessels that's what I'm going to do for my still life instead of thinking oh, I've got three, but I could photograph those in 20 different locations on the table. And then I could have 53, you know, of the same vessel on my still life. How interesting would that be? So I've included it um, because it's a technique that I'm sure some members would be interested in. I also think it's a good reminder for those members who don't um, play and use composites uh, and very much rely on photographing what is in front of the lens physically um, that there is an alternate space for you and please to you know keep that in mind and to consider you know um, I suppose uh, even if it involves learning new skills because you might not be easy that might not come naturally to you um, so I just I just found that work and I must say um, there's always something to be said for um, scale Myself. Pardon? Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Was that a question? No, sorry. Oh, that's no, okay. I'm no. thinking of something else. <laughs> okay, no worries. Um, with the, um, uh, there's something to be said, and, and keep this in mind for your own bodies of work, whether it's for during installation or actually even just in the creation of the work, there's always something to be said for scale. And if you remember some of those early works I showed where we had the massive big prints, you know, that were like the size of the gallery wall, scale is very impressive. Uh, and, and, and the inverse of big, you know, tiny little intimate images that you have to go up, you know, and look on the size of a brooch or something, very interesting as well. So always take into account scale and repetition or volume, very powerful as a technique as well. So keep, you know, keep this in mind for your own bodies of work. I'll just pick up the pace a little bit. Um, and now I'm getting into some fun things, which I hope are less academic in nature um, and a little bit more, um, I don't know, a bit back to the creative and exciting. 
So this is Jemima Wyman, which is W-Y-M-A-N, Jemima. Jemima Wyman, this was from 2020. Uh, this was on display at the IMA in Brisbane. It's a large scale digital collage printed on chiffon that collects images of smoke from recent global protests. This was made in 2020. The powerful tapestry of activist struggle includes plumes from flares released during Black Lives Matter rallies across the US, tear gas clouds released at pro-democracy demonstrations in Hong Kong, and ceremonial smoke following the destruction of Western Australia's Jukan Gorge by Rio Tinto. So Jemima Wyman um, identifies as an Aboriginal artist. And so therefore this work is personal and very authentic. But how fantastic is that? So it's printed on chiffon. It's a digital collage. It's large scale. It's, it's 12 metres by 18 metres. Um, and it's images of smoke from recent protests. Those protests being Black Lives Matter, pro-democracy in Hong Kong and the ceremonial smoke following the destruction of the gorge by Rio Tinto. Just fantastic. And you know, only that artist could have made that work because that was meaningful to them. So, and it's a hand cut photo collage. So anything goes, anything that's personal goes. And really, I don't think there's a formula. You just have to make work that is meaningful to you and think about a creative and exciting way to present it. Now, I've moved obviously into chiffon. I've, you know, we've looked at um, uh, photos, we've looked at, um, uh, um, you know, painting on uh, uh, photos on material, we looked at models. Um, so really, I've, I've, I've tried to, con I mean, it's photographic, everything we've looked at, but we're now, you know, keep in mind, we've branched beyond just the medium of a print. So that's Jemima Wyman, just loved that work. Oh, this is a fantastic um, collaborative um, called The Huxleys. And I'm including this for a couple of reasons. It's just wacky, isn't it? Just love it. The colour, who isn't sucked in, do you know what I mean? Instantly by that. Um, this is called Places of Worship. And it presents a longing for the precious jewels of the earth, connecting with glamour, um, outrageous beauty, uh, through costume and styling. And um, uh, these photographers identify as queer. And again, this is where we're starting to, you know, re always reminding ourselves that we have to make work that is, that is for us, that, that are our stories to tell. So contemporary photography and our post-internet, post-digital, post-postmodernist world, I'm not there to document these, the, the Huxleys who are the subjects in these photos. The Huxleys, the, the subjects are making photographs of themselves. And that's what's important now. It's not my job as a female photographer to go and take photos of two queer artists. That's just not what happens. Um, people make work about themselves, um, about their own stories and the role of the photographer uh, has shifted um, and we tell the stories that are ours to tell. So as queer people growing up in suburban, homogenous and conditioned places, feeling isolated, alone and different, um, the Huxley's new artworks embody feelings um, uh, and invite the viewer to find a beauty in the explosively queer bodies yearning for their difference to be marvelled at, worshipped and praised. Just fabulous. And look, on a similar note, I'm going to share the work by Gerwin Davies. So the last artists were the Huxleys. This is Gerwin Davies. Um, now Gerwin was recently commissioned to make work for Vogue magazine. I was actually taught by Gerwin at QCA Uni. He was one of the tutors. Um, anyway, he's been making this body of work for a number of years now and it's just you know exponentially grown where as I said Vogue has now commissioned him for um, 
for some work. I think it was Vogue. Um, anyway, so um, in an age of endless self-imaging, and these are fun, and I share them because they're crazy, they're fun, they're colourful, um, they're self-portrait as well, because I'm sure mem there's members of the group um, who are interested in self-portraiture. And what's great about these is that there are no faces involved, unlike the Huxleys, which is very much, you know, look at me, look at me, look at me. Um, we've got Gerwin very much saying, look at me, but you can't really, you know. Um, so combining, um, uh, it's a, it's a, a expanded potential for self-presentation that emerges on the stage of the digital image. Combining traditional costume making, so Gerwin makes his costumes, um, studio staging and digital interventions, the figure is unmoored from conventional representation and is an inventory of the synthetic self assembled. Bodies are adorned and choreographed for the lens. Their textured surface, surface allures and entices while the hefty costumes distort and conceal. The double bind of a figure both conspicuous yet nowhere to be seen, hiding in plain sight, triggers the work's investment in queering the act of representation and renegotiating the terms of queer in slash visibility. Adopting the excessive aesthetics of camp, these works explore the potential for performance self-representations to become queer cocoons inside which artists creatively redistribute their bodies for new formations. So again, I can't make photos like this. It's, 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 not, my, it's not my life, it's not my lived experience. So these are based on Gerwin's lived experiences but bringing to that something engaging and exciting and super fun, just super fun. So that was Gerwin Davies. Similarly, along similar lines, um, I shared this for the environmental walk. It's the latest favorite artist, Hiromi Tango, as in the dance, Tango. Now, Hiromi Tango has some work on up at the Caloundra Regional Gallery. I was up there um, on the weekend and had a look at it. But Hiromi is a Japanese-Australian artist whose work spans sculpture, painting, drawing, photography, projection and performance. Can you see that a contemporary photographer, I don't know, we're, we're not limited. Do you mean, and, and in fact, most artwork that is consumed is consumed through a photograph of the artwork. So Hiromi here is a performance artist because she's underneath those um, uh, constructions of the flowers. She's made the flowers um, and she's drawing on a lifelong passion for gardening and she explores our connection with nature and spaces like botanic gardens where they can generate calm, wellness and happiness among the bustle and stress of our contemporary existence. So another example of someone just doing something that floats their boat, that absolutely they, you know, her passion for garden, gardening. So here we've got Hiromi, who's a passionate gardener. Here we have Gerwin, who's queer and identifying and wanting to challenge, you know, um, the aesthetics of camp. Here we have the Huxleys that are saying, look at me, we're gay, we grew up in a really stressful time and we want you to worship us now. And here's um, Jemima saying, look at this stuff that's going on around the world to people of colour. Um, we're on fire, the world is on fire. And feeling how she feels. And there's, here's Abelardo Morel saying, I just like to look at white vessels and put them on a table. So I really hope that I'm continuing to send the message tonight that anything goes, you make work about anything that is true to you. If you like gardening, so does Hiromi Tango and pop out there in the garden. Now I haven't got many more slides to show, so I'm going to move on. Um, I'm conscious that we're coming up to finishing uh, in about 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to share just very quickly and fairly um, succinctly um, a couple of photographers that I'd like you to be aware of. Tamara Dean um, has you know, been around forever, but currently really on fire, metaphorically, with work that she's doing. She's a bit of the darling of the Australian art photographic world. Um, lovely image, tumbling through the tree tops. Um, just fabulous work. 
I encourage you to have a look at her work, Tamara Dean. The next photographer I want to show is Petrina Hicks. Now, Petrina Hicks, um, again, has been around for a long time. The work on the left um, uh, has, uh, I'm not quite sure how old that is now, but I'm going to pitch and say maybe about 10 years old. The work on the right is completely contemporary, and I think that's the entry in the bonus prize that's currently on display uh, at the MGA in Victoria. So um, uh, Petrina Hicks, look up her work. It's um, very clean. You can see the visual language is cons consistent through the bodies of work. Her background is in um, uh, commercial advertising photography. In fact, Tamara Dean's background is in um, documentary work. Uh, and again, make work that's good, that's, I suppose, that you're good at too. Um, challenge yourself, like we were saying earlier, but, you know, if you're good in this space, I suppose just continue on making the work that suits. Um, this is Polly Borland. I always show Polly Borland to upset people um, and challenge people, you know, what is a good photograph. So this was the winner of the Win Schubert Prize in 2017. It's a little bit old now. It's called Two Heads. But the judge for that was the director of Quagoma. Uh, who hailed two heads as a compelling, edgy and uncanny photograph. Um, it's a willful distortion of the portrait convention. It looks a little bit like a babushka doll, um, but it's also perhaps a corrupted version of the Narcissus myth. Um, it was, and the judge said, in the end, it was the photograph I found myself returning to most often. Now, Polly Borland is probably one of our most famous, although perhaps famous overseas, but perhaps unknown to us, um, one of our expats that lives in London and uh, is in all of the galleries, important national galleries, and was commissioned to uh, create a portrait for the Queen for the Queen's um, Diamond Jubilee. So you might look at this photo and write it off as being hideous, which I, I don't particularly respond to it. Excuse me, I don't love it. But this is work you can't poo-poo. Do you I mean you have to consider what this photographer is doing? And uh, I encourage you uh, to uh, look up Polly, Polly Borland. Um, she makes some crazy work. Even her portrait of the Queen was pretty cool. Moving on. Um, no, I'm, I'm actually going to not get too hung up on this. There's a lot of notes in the slides. Um, this artist is Chris Bowes. Uh, I know Chris, uh, he's ex-QCA as well. He's now down um, and did his honours through RMIT down in Melbourne. There's been a mass exodus actually of artists um, from Brisbane to Melbourne, uh, ph photographic artists uh, engaging. I really feel RMIT is where photography is happening at the moment in an, ac in an academic institution. Um, anyway, this is a body of work that Chris made. Um, it's called Sweat. Um, he would, these are silver gelatin chemigrams. He'd basically go into the dark room, get sweaty, put the paper on his face and create these abstract portraits. Chris has since moved on, still the love of portraiture, but moved on into digital portraiture. There's plenty of links in this, but it's Chris Bowes and there's a link through to this talk where um, he speaks about the definition of the post-digital and how that applies to photography. So if you're interested in digital, well, exploring the digital, the digitalness, the materiality of digital photography, if you're interested in the whole construct of the, what is digital photography, this guy is your guy. Sorry, that's my guy. That was my husband, Michael. I'll come to that in a sec. Um, Chris Bowes, B-O-W-E-S. Tons of information in the notes. And the talk that he's done there was through Photo Access, which is a, um, an amazing group out of Canberra. Um, really, really interesting. If this was an academic presentation um, to, a, you know, if it was a tertiary institution lecture, I uh, would have started with this work because um, Chris is exploring how do you take the analog, you know, the chemigram in the darkroom, how do you take the materiality of that because they're objects and put them in the digital in the gallery? So for example, this, this, what you see here, these screens look like that until a person walked in front of them and stood in front of them and then they 
they turned on to reflect the person's face back at them. So you are making your own portrait by standing in front of the screens. Anyway, fascinating work. Could be a little bit dry if you're not into that. Very academic, but really, really interesting. And Chris um, put uh, in, in the talk you'll find, oh, forget the name of the app, um, where, and this is the future where digital photography um, and, and apps and things like that is where we're going. Uh, let me just think what it's called. Hang on, bear with me. Uh, it's called, uh, oh God, I've forgotten. I've just, av 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 um, we'll find it anyway. So I took this photo of my hubby. We went out for brunch the other day. And you can see down here, this is an app, a free app. You can see down here that you can swap faces. So I took a selfie and then I put, the app put me onto my husband. Now, obviously, it's really bizarre, isn't it? You know, if you have a look at the previous photo of Michael and his glasses, his face structure, and then my face has been put on top of that. Now, this is a free app on my phone. And therefore, you know what can be done with, you know, um, with better technology and the deep fake. So I think the big thing that's coming in imagery is this idea of, the, of deep fakes. And um, look, I'll even, I'll see if I can share this with you. So this is my son. Um, uh, and he, he was, it's a little video and he was scrolling through his phone. So he's got big, buffy, curly hair. This is my face put on. And I'll just see if it shares. It might be a bit glitchy. Um, and it's my face, but it's his body. And literally, this was just done in the app. And I think that this is where a lot of new art is going to be made uh, in the future because it's that's what the definition of post-digital is. I don't want to bore you with it. But the idea is that, yep, we all know that photographs are made digitally, you know, but now what we want to do is have conversations around how the hell did we get to this? <laughs> and, you know, the next batch of artists are going to explore this. You know, I mean, I even want to explore that. I just find that just incredible. Um, and you can link it back to, anyway, we'll, we'll move on because I'll spend all night. Um, I do want to point out that you may have started to see some things on Instagram where you start, or Facebook, where people are starting to describe the image because not only are we looking at the digital and deep fake, but the next round um, and, and wave is the fact that there are people that can't engage with images through their vision. So, um, uh, so now what, and, and what's going to happen is through text, we're describing the images that are there and then technology will be able to do something with that to make it easy for people to understand the image without seeing the image. So if you've started to see that on Instagram, that's what that is. Speaking of Instagram, and these are in the notes, I recommend that you spend at least an hour a week looking at Instagram because that's the equivalent now of going into an art gallery and looking at exhibitions. What I suggest you do, though, is where do you start? It's like, where do you find photographers, you know, to explore these ideas? Where do you start? So I, these are some of my favourite people. Some of them are real people that I know in real life. Um, some favourite artists. But they're all really good, interesting, contemporary photo media artists. And what I suggest you do is not only just follow their work, but have a look and see who they're following because that's when you start to see, you know, really interesting artists whose work you would never come across, um, uh, you know, unless you actually were kind of introduced to them. So I'm sort of saying to you, this is a curated way into Instagram. So I've suggested some, there's Chris Bowes there, um, Charlotte Teagan, fabulous photographers doing some really, really interesting work um, in the digital space with floral photography. Really great. Um, Jacinta's lovely. She's doing some collage work. Lewis is fabulous. He does photo books. Uh, Tammy Laws is just all around awesome human being. Um, Mark um, just really got his finger on the pulse of um, some documentary type work. 
Um, so um, you can have, you know, th these notes are coming. Um, so, uh, and I can come back to them, but I just want to finish. I've got two more slides to finish on. And they're simply just to show you that in addition to, you know, an hour a week on Instagram as research, legitimate research, and like I said, look to see who these uh, artists are following. Um, you know, since COVID, of course, everything is online. I have tuned into so many National Portrait Gallery online talks. This one was an online talk about um, textiles, um, you know, the art in life of textiles. I mean, I wouldn't have had any opportunity to engage with this sort of uh, content because I wouldn't have been over in Virginia, you know, um, at this time. Uh, so just, I really want to encourage you to research, to get out of your bubble. And so many art institutions are now delivering things online that would allow you to engage again with, a me with mediums like textiles that you might not normally. And you know where the breakthroughs come in, in, um, in all art form is when you play on the edge of genre or you play on the edge of medium. So for example, if you've got an interest in textiles, how do people work with textiles? Well, you know, some of it's done through machine, some of it's done through hand. You know, how can you employ those techniques or strategies into your photography? And in fact, speaking of that, I do happen to know a carpet artist, um, uh, Joseph Burgess. Um, I should have put Joseph actually, and I will put Joseph on that list. Um, he actually makes carpets with a carpet gun and he's um, American and just, you know, so that whole gun culture thing is just fascinating anyway. So he makes big carpets um, as pieces of art. Anyway, you can imagine that I really could go on and on and on. Um, so I'm just going to come back here and end um, back on, I don't know, let's, oh, not those. Let's end on something that's just a bit, you know, there's Chris and his sweaty face. Actually, no, let's end on, um, uh, I love Hiromi Tango because I'm feeling calm now. Anyway, um, I think I'm done. So um, as I said, I'll get that inf this information to Brian. Um, if you've got any questions now or you, you, you missed uh, jotting down some of those Instagram handles, we can, um, uh, I can put those slides back up. But I'm very happy now to pass back to Brian for um, uh, for questions or or the like, because we've just come up to time, and I'm conscious that some people probably have to leave. So um, I'm done. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa. Now on the chat, I, I think I'm right in saying there was only one question specifically as we went through. And uh, it was from Judy Newman. She was talking about the um, the cricket imagery uh, by um, Trent Park, and yes. she asked, "Are these the result of sports imagery done to improve technique, as is quite often done by physios, etc., at Institute of Sport?" Um, Judy, I th yes, I think um, Trent's sons are genuinely are cricket players. So I should have said that actually, that these are photographs of his children. So it's really a very personal body of work. And Judy, um, I'm, I'm actually not quite sure if the end product really is that it's, you know, for his sons to improve or whether they're humouring dad, you know, and, and getting all the gear strapped on. Um, but uh, certainly I know that there's a fair bit of work online that you can read about to get more context for this particular body of work. But I just love the intersection between science and art and sport. Now that's a combination that doesn't happen very often. Um, I know science and art has been very popular in the last few years. Like for example, Renata Buziak does her um, photograms using um, natural botanicals. Um, but to see science, art and sport together, that's something new altogether. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Um, uh, I, I might go through everybody who's online and give you all a chance to ask a question. So while you're thinking of your question, let me just make a couple of observations. The um, it was interesting when you showed that work of Chris Bowes 
um, which was in the, the photo access gallery and uh, which I actually had the opportunity to see. And, oh, uh, fantastic, and it, Ron. And it, it really was wonderful. I, I used to be a deputy chair of photo access, but... Oh, did you? Okay. But I, I'm, I'm still a member, but nowadays, of course, I only review their work. But, yes. um, but I've stood where that woman is in front of those screens and had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, it's a bit like the modern day version of standing in front of those curved mirrors at Sideshow Alley. I yeah, thought. he described and, it like that, said it was yeah. like that crazy, distorted, fun thing. Yeah, and if you go back to the shot before that, the, um, the other person in the top left corner there is um, Rory Gillen. Who, who actually works at Photo Access, but yes. right now he's got an exhibition on of his own at the Tuggeranong Arts Centre, which I'm in the process of reviewing. Oh, and fantastic. it's it's quite uh, quite fascinating. It's called Uncalibrated Space. And um, there's a, not a great deal on their website uh, because uh, Tuggy Arts Centre is not terribly good at that sort of thing, but okay. but to the extent there's something there, it's worth taking a look at. And uh, I think Rory's uh, heading in the same direction as Chris, actually. Yeah, and that that um, so that was an artist talk, or it was a conversation between Rory and Chris. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. They're both. The, it was a really fantastic and very interesting conversation because they're both in that digital, and then what they're wanting to do is deconstruct the digital because. That's right. Without boring everybody, you know, the, the politics that sit behind, because ultimately there is someone in charge. And that's what we're all starting to realise now with the algorithms and things that are controlling yeah, um, yeah. our truth. Anyway, I will, yeah. I'll, pick, I'll hand back to you, Brian. Okay, so I'll just run through the list of people who are online and see if you've got any more questions. And I'll, I'll go back to Judy, first of all. Judy Newman, do you have any other questions you want to ask? Um, I don't think. No? I do. All right. What about Tony Harding? Okay, Judy's microphone's not working. We'll come back to you when you get it working, Judy. Tony, do you have any questions? Yes, sure. Just how, how important would you say there, Lisa, is the artist's statement? Because when there's something mm. which is quite experimental, if you like, you know, to relay and convey can be difficult without that, perhaps. Yeah, definitely, Tony. And I think, again, you know, because your group and, and you as photographers, you're probably likely to be thinking exhibition and even online, you know, if it's maybe not sort of um, in, in the gallery space, I've assumed that, you know, you're open to the artist statement and they are important, you know, in mm -hmm. the art context. Um, so I'm, I'm on board with them because we aren't talking about, you know, camera club competition where things are just judged on the, you know, on the impact of the image. Although I must say that, you know, the really amazing artwork does stand on its own, doesn't it? You know, there, there are some images that um, don't require an artist statement, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm bored with them and I think they are important. Um, and I don't necessarily believe that an image has to stand on its own. Um, but I know that the really incredible work can sit without an artist statement, but I believe in them and I think they're important. Mm. I like artist statements um, that are, I suppose then though, Tony, it comes into what, what kind of artist statements. Some people like to, you know, speak about process. Some people like to speak about, you know, their feelings about the work, um, the history about the work. Some people like to be quite academic and refer to their influences and, and quote, you know, sources. Um, I don't really have an opinion on that, and I think it's whatever artist statement suits you and suits your work. Thanks very much. It's a great answer. Thank you. Okay. Well, unless anybody else has got any questions, um, we'll wrap it up. There's quite a lot of people have put things on the in the chat. Uh, Lisa saying how much they've enjoyed the presentation, which uh, and saying thank you to you. Um, uh, and I. I would join them in saying saying that it's it's just been great, exactly what uh, what I expected, of course, after listening to you before, and uh, I would add my thanks to everybody else. It's just wonderful, and I hope that uh, everybody will come up with all sorts of new and wonderful things.